Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Exactly three days ago, a riot broke out in the Solomon Islands. Hundreds of shops were burnt. The rioters stormed the country's parliament. They even torched some property owned by the Prime Minister. The government of the day is blaming foreign powers for these riots. They say the protesters are being influenced. Well, they're right. Someone is indeed meddling in the Solomon Islands. But it's not the protesters who are being influenced, it's the politicians and the policy makers, those in the government. Two years back, Beijing apparently bribed the politicians in the Solomons. Votes were bought to dump Taiwan in favor of Beijing. That same money is the reason behind the violence and the unrest today. On Gravitas tonight, we'll tell you about China's influence campaign, how China is buying influence by paying off politicians and, in, and influencing government policy, how these bribes are backfiring for Beijing. Also on the show tonight, the most dangerous variant of the Wuhan virus is said to have surfaced in South Africa. Reports say it challenges vaccine immunity. More than seven countries are imposing travel curbs. China's crackdown on tech giants is not yet over. The Communist Party's leaders are now mulling a data tax. We'll tell you what that means. Governments in Germany and Japan are giving millions of workers a pay hike. We'll tell you why. And 13 years ago, India suffered its worst ever terror attack. The perpetrators have still not been punished. We pay a tribute to the victims of 2611. We begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. French President Emmanuel Macron slams UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson over his handling of the Channel Refuge tragedy. The diplomatic row erupted after France withdrew a summit invitation to the UK Home Secretary Priti Patel. This after at least 27 refugees drowned this week in waters separating France and the UK. The police in Siberia arrested two safety inspectors suspected of criminal negligence after at least 50 people were killed in one of the worst mine disasters in Soviet times. Authorities say a methane explosion was the likely cause of the accident at the mine. In just a year into his presidency, Joe Biden's approval ratings hit an all-time low. Latest Yahoo News and YouGov poll suggests over three-quarters of Americans say rising inflation is affecting their lives negatively ahead of the holiday season. And 57% blame Biden for it. Germany's Air Force gets ready for the first time in the pandemic to fly severely ill patients to other parts of the country. This as Germany reported a record of more than 76,000 Covid cases in a day, straining the hospitals in the country. Ukraine says that it has received information about a possible coup attempt slated for December that involves Russians. President Volodymyr Zelensky did not directly accuse the Russian government of involvement. Russia has dismissed the suggestions of any impending attack. Ethiopia announces new rules against sharing information on battlefield outcomes in the war against Tigrayan rebels, a move that could bring sanctions against journalists. This as Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed goes to the front line to fight Tigrayan forces. 
Reports say that gunmen have attacked a Libyan court before an appeal by the son of slain former ruler Muammar Gaddafi against the rejection of his presidential election candidacy. The attack has alarmed the United Nations. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi is wanted by the International Criminal Court for alleged war crimes. A female Pakistani journalist in Lahore was attacked while driving late at night. It is unclear why Ambreen Fatima and her family were targeted. She is the wife of an investigative journalist who was also attacked in 2017 in Islamabad. Pat Cummings has become the first fast bowler to be appointed as Australia's permanent test captain. The 28-year-old replaces Tim Payne, who stepped down from the role last week over a sexting scandal from four years ago. Payne has now withdrawn from the Ashes squad and will take an indefinite break for mental health reasons. Steve Smith has been appointed vice-captain and returns to a leadership role for the first time since the 2018 ball-tampering saga. India's Shreyas Iyer marked his debut test innings with a century, but New Zealand have taken the honours on day two in Kanpur. Tim Southey claimed five wickets to reduce India from an overnight score of 258 for 4 to 345 all out. Kiwi openers Will Young and Tom Latham then hit unbeaten half centuries to lead the visitors to 129 for no loss at stumps. Leaders take an oath to serve their citizens all over the world. But what happens when the same leaders become pawns for a foreign power? The citizens suffer, the country is cheated, a national interest is compromised. And this invariably leads to a pushback. This is what it looks like. <laughs> This is the capital of the Solomon Islands, Oniara. Three days ago, anti-government protests erupted here. These are violent protests, as you can see. A building next to the parliament was set on fire. A police station was torched. Shops were looted. Within hours, the city turned into a war zone. Now, for those of you who are wondering why this small island nation is our cover story tonight, I will explain. These riots in the Solomon Islands did not erupt due to domestic factors. They happened because of China. Because of Beijing's growing influence slash interference. Chinese cash is said to have triggered these riots. And I'm not talking about Chinese investments here. I'm talking about Chinese bribes. The money China reportedly paid to buy influence in the Solomon Islands. Influence for what? To get this country to dump Taiwan. The Solomon Islands broke diplomatic ties with Taiwan and switched allegiances to China. This one move has divided the country. Why should you care? Because the next country on this list could be yours. China has reportedly bribed politicians to dictate government policy. Today it is the Solomon Islands. Tomorrow it could be any other country. On Gravitas tonight, we'll tell you how China's bribes led to a riot and how this move has backfired for Beijing. Let's begin with what's happening in the Solomon Islands. No new incidents of violence or arson have been reported today, but there's, a, there's an uneasy calm on the streets. Public anger is simmering, and the fury is directed at one man. Manase Sogavare, the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, he's the man who made the switch happen, the switch from Taiwan to China. For the protesters, he is enemy number one right now. They targeted Sugavare's compound. They could not get to his residence, so they decided to go after a building that the Prime Minister owns. It was set on fire. That is the extent of the public anger. These images tell the story. Sogavari is facing the wrath of his citizens, and it's not just because of his China policy. The list of complaints is rather long, we are told. Lack of government services and accountability, corruption, the influx of foreign workers, all of this has led to this anger. The Prime Minister is on the back foot. The protesters want him to step down. He says he won't. He blames the classic foreign hand. He says the protesters have been influenced by foreign powers. Here is a quote. This is what he says. External pressures 
were a very big influence. I don't want to name names. We we'll leave it there. I'm not going to buy down to bow down to anyone. We are intact. The government is intact, and we are going to defend democracy. Prime Minister Sogavari is right. There is foreign meddling in the Solomon Islands, but it's not the protesters who are being influenced. It is the politicians. The Solomon Islands established diplomatic ties with Beijing in the year 2019, when the switch happened from Taipei to Beijing. Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs made a revelation. It said that China was bribing politicians in the Solomon Islands to abandon Taipei. And that claim was confirmed by a politician himself in this country. A provincial leader spoke out in 2019. His name is Daniel Suidani. He is the premier of Maliata. This province is at the forefront of the protests that are happening right now. Citizens from Maliata marched to the capital Honiara to protest. Two years back, China tried to buy some influence there too, in the province. So Idani says that he was approached by someone from the Chinese government. He was offered cash. He refused the money. Also refused to vote in favor of dumping Taiwan. Two years later, he was made to pay for that decision. This lawmaker apparently needed funds for a brain surgery. An appeal was made to Prime Minister Sogavari. The request was turned down. Allow me to quote what Suidani has said. What happened in terms of the switch is not clear, but there is something going on between China and the Solomons that makes them switch without consulting with the people of the nation. Something was indeed fishy then. Two years later, the picture has become clearer. Despite massive public opposition, Beijing is unrelenting in its support for Prime Minister Sogavari. Listen to this. China pays close attention to the current developments in the Solomon Islands and condemns the violent acts that have caused serious damage and property losses. China supports Solomon government's efforts to stop violence and chaos. We believe that under the leadership of Prime Minister Sogavare, the Solomon government can restore order and stabilize the internal situation as soon as possible. China is taking all necessary measures to safeguard the safety and legitimate rights and interests of Chinese citizens and institutions in the Solomon Islands. So in two days, Beijing has released two statements supporting the Prime Minister. But this situation is out of its control. Chinese citizens and businesses are under attack in the Solomon Islands. More than 100 shops owned by the Chinese have been destroyed. According to the Global Times, some shop owners are quote unquote hiding in the hills. The Chinese embassy asked its nationals to not go out. China has offered support to Prime Minister Sogavari, but taking help from Beijing would be a suicidal move at this point. So he's turned to Australia. In 2017, Australia and the Solomon Islands signed a bilateral treaty. It allows rapid deployment of Australian police and defence personnel to the islands if there is an emergency. Around 100 Australian troops arrived overnight. They restored peace, albeit a tenuous one. We are there uh, to uh, support the Solomon Islands uh, Police, Royal, Poli Royal Solomon Islands Police Force, um, to quell any unrest that is there and hopefully see the situation uh, return to some calm. Uh, overnight we have seen what started as a protest, uh, we have seen some more indiscriminate looting and things of that nature, um, which is a more general civil unrest and behaviour and we want to see that come under control. At present that is, that is proceeding I'd say reasonably but you know, we're, on, we're on alert and that's why we're continuing to provide further support. Support is good. Spine would be better. Leaders who stand up to China and resist the temptations of its checkbooks. Many small nations have shown how to do this. The Pacific Island nation of Nauru stood up to China. It rejected a project to build Chinese undersea network cables. Palau is another island nation. It refused to give up its diplomatic ties with Taiwan. Since 2016, Beijing has been targeting these small but vulnerable island nations. It has forced them to dump Taiwan. At least seven countries have broken diplomatic ties with Taiwan in the last five years. But 16 countries still recognize Taiwan. And China is targeting them, trying to buy influence, bribe politicians, use dirty tricks to force a switch. 
And by the way, China's influence campaigns are not limited to small island nations. In 2016, a lawmaker in Australia had to step down. Why? Because he took money from Chinese donors. Chinese donors paid his travel and legal bills. In return, this Australian lawmaker took a pro-China line on the issue of South China Sea, a clear case of quid pro quo. In other words, a bribe. What happened in the Solomon Islands and Australia serves as a lesson for the rest of the world. China's wars take many shapes. Propaganda and policy infiltration can prove to be the hardest ones to fight. Also, the virus from China. It's proving to be very hard to fight. It has mutated yet again. A new variant of the Wuhan virus is spreading in South Africa. Scientists are calling it the deadliest variant till date. The most horrific version, quote-unquote, of the Wuhan virus. Such statements have triggered panic. This morning, almost every market in the world knows died. From India to China to Japan, stocks were in the red across the world. Countries are rushing into travel restrictions yet again. The UK, Germany, Italy, they've all banned flights from South Africa. Other countries are mulling such travel restrictions. Are these fears justified? Is this variant really the deadliest? Our next report has some answers. <laughs> Twenty twenty one may be coming to an end. The pandemic isn't. The Delta variant is still spreading. It has infected most of Europe and America. Such is the state of affairs. That Germany has deployed its air force to airlift severely ill patients to hospitals. As if this wasn't enough. Another variant has now been discovered. The most heavily mutated variant of the Wuhan virus so far. Where is it spreading? South Africa. What is it called? B11529. How deadly is it? In one word, very. Some scientists are describing it as horrific. Some others say it's the worst variant they've ever seen. In South Africa, the cases are limited to just one province, the province of Gauteng, the most populated province in the country, with the global financial hub Johannesburg as its capital. The South African health minister says this poses a very serious challenge for the country. So it does present a major challenge in terms of uh, further activities, uh, so, uh, social, you know, social activities. We're hoping, amongst others, that we can have more social activities, but this is going to present a major challenge. Still have to be looked at. The variant may no longer be just South Africa's problem. It has already breached borders. Cases have been detected in Botswana, also in Hong Kong, where health experts say that the variant may already be circulating globally. The chances are that this virus has traveled to, to many other parts of the world, uh, and maybe those other places haven't yet realized it or haven't yet recognized it. Of course, the resumption of international travel is to blame. But so is the virality of this variant. It has more than 30 mutations in its spike protein, which is making it spread faster than previous variants. Scientists are worried that with so many mutations, this variant may even escape the immune response induced by vaccines. Researchers are working to understand more about the mutations and what they potentially mean for how transmissible or virulent this variant is, and how they may impact our diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. The news has triggered panic. It has hammered the confidence of investors. There is a bloodbath in global markets. This morning, Japan's Nikkei slumped to its lowest level in a month. South Korea's shares ended at a two-week low. Hong Kong's shares closed at their lowest in weeks. And in India, the Sensex slumped by 1,700 points. 
its worst fall in seven months. With markets in the red, countries across the world are rushing into travel restrictions. Germany has suspended all flights from South Africa. This morning we decided that South Africa and some neighboring countries will be declared a variant zone in the short term. The United Kingdom has suspended flights from at least six African countries. Those countries are South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, Eswini, and Zimbabwe and Botswana. And the European Union Commission is mulling a Europe-wide ban for all flights from South Africa. The European Commission uh, will propose in close coordination uh, with member states to activate the emergency brake to stop air travel from uh, the Southern African uh, region due to the variant of concern B11529. India too has issued an advisory. All travelers from countries reporting the new variant will be put in the at-risk category. They will have their contacts traced and tested. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has sprung into action as well. WHO experts will meet in Geneva over the weekend to decide if the new variant should be declared a variant of concern. Bureau report, we on. World is one. Wuhan virus cases rising in China too. New cases have been detected in three cities in the last few days. In Shanghai, 500 flights have been cancelled and schools have been shut. It is a time for the people. And it doesn't help that their burdens may be set to grow. The Communist Party of China is mulling a new policy, a new tax to finance what Xi Jinping calls his common prosperity drive. They're calling it a data tax. A tax meant for China's digital economy. The concept is unheard of. It's also a bit murky. What does a data tax really mean? A data tax basically implies that profits earned through data must be returned to the society, to the individuals who produce this data, and not just specific stakeholders. I know it sounds a bit confusing. Let me try to simplif simplify it further. Tech giants possess a lot of information about their customers, people like you and me. A lot of personal data, which they gather through their services. Now, they use this data to expand their services. They also sell this data to earn profits. We all know this. What sort of data are we talking about here? Well, everything you do online, from your personal information to your precise location, from your browsing history to your online preferences, all of it, if it is data, there is a good chance that tech giants are collecting it and in most cases also selling it. They're making money off you. Especially in China, data collection is the name of the game. It is, after all, a surveillance state. Privacy is a myth in this country. The state and its tech giants know almost everything about the average Chinese citizen. What Beijing wants to do now, or is believed to want to do now, is tax tech giants for knowing so much. Make them pay for the information they gather, share the profits they earn through such data. The concept, in all fairness, is interesting. It is also dangerous, given that it's China we're talking about here. How did it start? With a speech. A speech by a renowned Chinese economist, also a former CCP official. His name is Huang Chifan. Last month, Huang attended the Shanghai Forum and he broached the idea of a data tax. He said that tech giants should pay this tax. If they traded the data of any of their users, they should pay a tax on it. Allow me to quote his exact words. This is what he said. Data has the characteristic of a public good. Its jurisdiction and transaction rights should belong to the state, while all data activities should follow national data security regulations. Platforms that own a large amount of personal data should return 20 to 30 percent of the revenue they obtain from data transactions to the data producers. Now, he said this on the 24th of October. The very next day, on the 20th, internet giants like Alibaba and Tencent began to slump. They nosedived for three straight days. And since then, commentators in the Communist Party and within the Chinese state media have been speculating if Beijing will consider imposing a data tax. 
essentially they've been promoting the concept. They say that this could be used to push antitrust measures to stop online firms from dominating big data markets. Now consider this. In July 2020, China's cybersecurity watchdog launched a probe against Didi. It is China's homegrown ride-hailing app, like an, Uber, uh, like, a, like, like an Uber or Ola. So why did the government crack down on Didi? Because the company went public at the New York Stock Exchange. It raised $4.4 billion in its initial public offering or IPO, and China did not like it. China feared that Didi would share information with the U.S., so the government went after the company. Then in November 2020, China went after the Ant Group. That's Jack Ma's company. Beijing halted its IPO plan in the United States, and this IPO could have been the world's biggest ever. China scotched it. Its motives were the same. It worried that the company's big data resources would be shared with American regulators. And now China is talking about a data tax. This is very much in line with China's moves of late. With a tax like this, Beijing plans to kill two birds with one stone. One, it can enhance its data monitoring skills, force tech companies to share the information they possess. In fact, they already have a law in place for this. Now, with this new step, they could enforce it further. And the second gain they stand to make is money. China can earn money by taxing tech giants for how they use that information. Reports say China is already planning to set up a center from where it will manage local data activities, also help all Chinese cities monitor what data is shared online, what kind of data. It's going to be a massive project of data fusion. It could merge all data streams that flow on the Chinese internet. Suffice to say, the Chinese regime's control over the internet is entering a bigger and more sinister stage. So this is what we have so far. Chaos in the Solomon Islands. There's a threat Han virus variant. And data may just become taxable in the near future. You know what else is happening? Buried below the chaos of the pandemic, the complicated policies and the mind-boggling politics are protests where women are screaming to make their voices heard. <laughs> What these women are demanding is very safety. They want the world to be a safer place for women. Did you know that women make up 49.58% of the world's population? Half the world's population. Isn't that a huge number? Yet somehow our survival is under threat. Somehow our safety is under threat. Even our progress today is under threat. Why is that? Listen to this. We raped in college, we raped in the university, we raped at work. We are nearly half the population. We need our rights to be heard, for our rights to be just as valid as those of men. We need our rights to be just as valid as those of men. It's a very simple demand, but women's safety has become too big of an ask. Today, one in three women experience violence. 736 million women are subjected to physical or sexual violence. One in four women who have been in a relationship have experienced violence by an intimate partner. 243 million women and girls were abused by an intimate partner in the last one year. Today, intimate partners are responsible for 33% of murders. 6% of women globally have been assaulted by someone other than a partner. And you know, these are not just numbers. These are people, women, women who are living in unimaginable circumstances, who are under immense stress. These are women who are entitled to their rights, but those rights, whose rights are being violated on some very, so many different levels. 
Many of them are too scared to speak out. Did you know that 40% of women who experience violence do not report it? So this year, on International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, the United Nations started a campaign. It's called Hashtag Orange the World. Orange symbolizes a brighter future, free of violence. And this campaign aims to amplify the message, calls for women's safety, help the survivors of violence, and give voice to the voiceless. Thousands of women across the world have taken to the streets in support of this campaign. They're shouting slogans, demanding their rights, demanding an end to violence against women. But you know what's funny? Fighting against violence today has become a crime in itself in some places. Women asking for safety are being met with violence. I'll show you what happened in Turkey. Women had taken out a march. They were protesting President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's policy. So all the president's men stepped out in battle gear to fight these women. <laughs> In March this year, President Trump pulled Turkey out of an international treaty that was meant to protect women from violence. In the days that followed, 353 women were killed, 409 women were killed the year before. What is the government doing about it? Greeting women with brute force. Mexico too is guilty of suppressing women's voices with violence. In the last 24 hours, women in Mexico City have been attacked with fire extinguishers and greeted with riot police. <laughs> There were 13 femicides in Greece this year. These activists are reminding the world about it. They're reading out the names of the victims, along with their age and their home time. A woman in Spain was carrying this banner, one I thought that every woman watching this show tonight will resonate with. This banner reads, send me a message once you get home. Haven't we all been told this? Our parents worry every time we step out. As parents, we worry every time our daughter steps out of the house. We tell them to be careful about who they talk to, be careful about how much they share, carry a pepper spray, look out for danger, and send a message when you reach because girls are not safe. Girls are killed in their mother's womb. Infants are raped at home. Young girls are unsafe in school. Adolescents are abused by their partners. There are sleazy bosses at work. Countries are too scared to call marital rape a crime. Do you know we women live in a wholly different world? One where we are always just a couple of seconds away from danger. One where fear is normal. We are here today asking the state and the whole of society to put an end to violence against women, to femicides, to let them know obstetric violence is real and that in the height of the 21st century we are still being victimized, we are still being oppressed and violence remains normal in society. How did we come to this? How did half of the world's population become a threat to the survival of the other half? Why has violence against women been normalized? It is time for change. It is time to speak up, to protest this injustice, demand the rights that every woman deserves. It's time to orange the world. Over to Iran now, where the farmers are fighting for their rights too. They want water. An entire river has gone dry in central Iran. Thousands of farmers have been protesting for more than three weeks now. They directed tents on the dry riverbed to make a point, but instead of listening to their demands, the Iranian security forces are now going after them. Here's a report. This is not your regular protest site. A river used to flow from right here. When it dried up, some Iranians turned up to protest. This is how they were forced to leave. Their tents were set on fire. That was the sound of gunfire. Iran's riot police fired that shot. 
they were tasked with cleaning up the area. Those leaving these camps are the farmers of Isfahan. Their fields are thirsty. These farmers use water from the Zayan Derud River for irrigation. But for much of the year now, that river runs dry. Since the 8th of November, thousands of farmers have been on protest. They are demanding the Zayan Derud River back. But instead of water, they got the fury of the state. Iranian security forces have moved swiftly and fiercely to crush these protests, just like the last time. Similar protests had broken out earlier in July. Iranians in southwest Khuzestan were on the streets. They too wanted water, but they got bullets. Droughts are now common in Iran. 2021 is one of the driest years in the history of the country, and everyone is affected. From urban households to villages. The reason is a major depletion of groundwater. Key lakes and sources of water are running dry, and the shortages will get worse. In the next 50 years, aquifers in 12 out of 31 Iranian provinces are expected to go dry. Iran can't expect any help from the neighborhood either. There is a water crisis in Iraq and Syria too. 12 million people are at risk. Earlier this year, Iraq wanted more water from Syria. But Syria itself is battling the worst drought in 70 years. Earlier this month, a major reservoir in Idlib completely dried up. Water is already among the most scarce commodities in the world, but in West Asia, the scarcity is taking the form of a crisis, one that is increasing the risk of more conflict. Bureau report, we are World is One. Rich person are not like money. When accumulated, money becomes a sign of power. When saved, it becomes a sign of safety. When pulled together for a cause, money becomes unity. When contributed, it becomes a sign of support. When paid over and above your salary, money becomes a reward. And tonight we'll talk about the last one, money as reward. Have you ever taken an exam where winners were given prize money? You have, trust me. The name of the test was the Wuhan virus pandemic. It was the toughest test our generation had to take. Those who managed to cope with it and grow with it are now being rewarded. It is happening around the world. Earlier this year, IT companies in India gave record, record hikes to their employees. In the US, Microsoft announced a $1,500 pandemic bonus for all employees. Amazon gave special recognition bonuses. And Walmart rolled out bonuses as a sign of appreciation for the sustained commitment of their employees. In other words, companies around the world are rolling out higher pay packages and bonuses as a sign of appreciation as reward. In some countries, governments are stepping in to ensure that people are rewarded. Take Germany, for example. The country has just had a change in leadership. Olaf Scholz will be the next chancellor of Germany, and one of his first promises is the promise of a better pay. The minimum pay in Germany will now be changed to $13.45 an hour. What is the current rate? $10.77 an hour. This pay raise will benefit nearly 2 million workers. The Chancellor has announced a 25% pay hike for 2 million workers. What called for this raise? The pandemic, what else? It triggered an inflation, contributed to price rise. Those who worked hard to cope with the pandemic and worked through the health crisis are now struggling to make ends meet. So Germany is now rewarding its ground level workers with an increased pay. Is the move completely apolitical? Of course it's not. What better way to say the government cares than by increasing a worker's take-home money? Money, while a brilliant reward, is also a means to restore confidence in a country and reinforce trust in a government. 
So that's what Germany is doing. Thousands of miles away, Japan too is asking companies to offer more salary to its employees. This country too has a new leader in office, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. He has asked firms to give more money to their employees, at least 3% more than their current salaries. This proposal targets firms whose earnings have recovered to pre-pandemic levels. And there is additional focus on frontline and essential workers. Kishida's government, aim, in fact, wants to raise their incomes by 3% every year. Now, do you remember how during the numerous waves of the pandemic, the internet often pointed out that the frontline workers are also among the least paid workers? So Japan is aiming to bridge that pay gap. It plans to raise the salaries of child care workers. This is Japan showing its appreciation to those who put others before themselves during the pandemic. As economies recover, more companies, more countries should follow suit. They should reward workers for their dedication. The last two years have not been easy on anyone. Employees have had to cope with the new normal, learn to work from home, learn to coordinate despite social distancing, balance work and caregiving duties. Most of them stuck it out. Many went out of their way to deliver. Some exceeded expectations. It is only fair that they're all rewarded. And it's the 26th of November. It's a day of historic significance for India. It was on this day that the country suffered its worst ever terrorist attack. It was also on this day that India took the first step to becoming a republic. It was on the 26th of November in 1949 when the Kutu Assembly of India adopted the Indian Constitution. Today is the 72nd anniversary of that historic event. As we remember the visionaries who framed our constitution, let's also try to re-educate ourselves about how it came into being. Shed light on some facts that are not discussed too often, some stories about our constitution. It was drafted in the most challenging of times, a three-year period between 1946 and 49. This was a time when communal riots, caste wars and political divisions were threatening the social fabric of the country. Yet the architects of our constitution managed to frame one of the most ex extensive handwritten documents. A constitution that was unique in terms of its content, spirit and effort. A 389 member constituent assembly held at least 11 sessions to frame it. These sessions covered a total of 165 days. Of these, 114 days were spent just on the consideration of the draft. And more than 2,000 amendments were made to the first draft alone, 2,000. You think that's too much? Then wrap your head around this. The Indian constitution is the longest written constitution in the world. It is 30 times as long as the American constitution, 30, 3, 0. It keeps getting bigger. In its original form, the constitution... The Constitution of India had 395 articles and it was, it was divided into 22 parts and 8 chapters. In its current form, it has 448 articles, 22 parts, 12 schedules and 5 appendices. All written in a total of 1,46,385 words. Unlike the current Constitution, the original was not printed or typed, it was handwritten by one man. Prem Bihari Narayan Rai Zada, he was a who hand wrote the Constitution of India following italic style. Each page of the Constitution was then decorated by a team of artists from Shanti Niketan. They were led by Nandlal Bose, the pioneer of modern Indian art. Original copies of the Constitution he designed are stored in helium filled cases in the Indian Parliament Central Library. In December 2012, a copy of the first edition of the Constitution of India, which was signed by India's first president, Rajendra Prasad, was auctioned by Sotheby's in London. Do you know for how much? 40,000 pounds. That's 35.6 lakh Indian rupees. And here's something else that you must know. The Constitution of India is the most amended constitution in the world. It has been amended a total of 104 times, 104 amendments in 71 years. The American Constitution was adopted in 1789 and it has been amended just 27 times so far. So why has the Indian one been amended so many times? Also, what sort of amendments have been made?
Most of them have been brought by respective Indian governments when they were in majority. For example, in 1970, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi introduced the word secular and socialist to the constitution. This was soon after she imposed an emergency. Another amendment was made in 1989 when the voting age was reduced from 18 to 21. To 18 rather, from 21. And more recently, in 2019, the constitution was amended to include the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act, which reconstituted the state into two union territories. And these were just a few stories about the Constitution of India. I'm sure there are many more, many more reasons to celebrate it, also to safeguard it. And now to the second reason why 2611 is a historic date in India, a date that no Indian can forget. 13 years ago on this date, India was attacked. Its maximum city, its city of dreams, Mumbai was attacked. Ten Pakistani terrorists entered Mumbai by sea and struck its major landmarks. Eight coordinated attacks shook the city. And the, the world watched restlessly. As images of the mayhem beamed day and night, every Indian alive at that time and of a certain age has vivid memories of the attack. We remember the emotions that ran through us as we covered what was happening, as we sat glued to our TV screens, watching the death toll climb, listening to updates pour in. Sure, India had been attacked before, Mumbai had been attacked before, but never was the country so shaken. 2611 targeted every layer of Indian society, every class of people living in India's maximum city. The elites dining in Trident and Taj hotels, youngsters unwinding at a popular South Mumbai cafe, regular Mumbaikers at the CST station who were going back home after a long day's hard work, even patients recovering at Kama Hospital. The terrorists spared no one. In India, we say Mumbai is a city that never sleeps. But 2611 brought Mumbai to a standstill. But was that a victory for the terrorists? Did their master sitting in Pakistan manage to scare India? Target India's growth by attacking its economic capital? Far from it, India jumped back stronger than ever. By 20, 2811, Indian forces had secured all sites. The country stood together, united in pledging never again. A lot has changed in these last 13 years. This change has been for the better. India has learned to respond to attacks better. National security station at all metro cities. Our local police today are better armed. 2611 made India realize it needed to draw a red line with Pakistan. That nothing good could come by talking to a terror state. In the last 13 years, India has managed to isolate Pakistan at the world stage in so many different ways. India will never forget 2611 and never forgive 2611. Although the masterminds still remain free, unpunished. Tonight, Gravitas Images is in the memory of the 166 people who lost their lives to this attack. At about 9.50 we start hearing some firing. <laughs> 